Well, we are finally out of Revelation chapter 18, which uh, shouldn't be a relief because we should never be relieved to get out of any particular passage in Scripture. But Revelation 18 has been somewhat difficult uh, because we've encountered very graphic imagery as we've looked at the world system represented as Babylon the prostitute. Okay, Uh, Now, we're continuing on with that to a degree here today, but we're moving what I would say is a little bit more of a positive direction as we see not just the judgment of things that have been evil, wrong, awful, that have corrupted the earth, but we're going to see a very beautiful picture, a a picture of the church in her splendor being beheld by the angels and and seen. This is a beautiful thing, Jesus, that you have done. This is a beautiful picture to behold. And so uh, Revelation 19 is where we're, we're going this morning, and verses 1 through 10 specifically are going to help us see this. And so I will read the passage for us. And I want you to kind of keep your eyes peeled for a particular theme, and that theme is beauty, okay? The theme is beauty. We could kind of break this passage down into a couple different sections, but we're going with these 10 verses, and the theme of beauty is something that I want you to be thinking about because there is a type of beauty that we all see. There's a type of beauty that, you know, you, you, you look in the, you go to Metro Market, and you stare at the magazines, and it's like Vogue, and you've got these beautiful women on the cover, right? And supposedly beautiful women on the cover. And there are different things that are kind of vying for attention. Well, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. And, and I think Revelation 19, 1 through 10 helps us get a perspective on beauty in a way that will help us. And this is not just for the ladies, but this is for all of us to consider what is beautiful because we want to be beautiful in God's sight. We want to be beautiful. And so verses 1 through 10, chapter 19, read the following. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more, they cried out, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those, happy are those, who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here's your big idea for this morning. And like I said, beauty is is a big part of it. There's also this aspect of worship. And I just want to draw the connection right away for you guys because we worship what is beautiful, right? We don't see ugly things and say that, that is, uh, that's, that's lovely, right? Worship is ascribing worth, ascribing value and saying this has worth. This has a certain degree, a certain quality of, 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 of beauty. I, I, I like this. I desire this, I want this, and so you worship. And so here, as we see beauty, as we see worship intertwined, even to the point where John is falling at the feet of this angel who's beautiful in his holiness, and the angel, like, don't, don't do this, don't do this, you worship God. So as this mixture, we have a worship in beauty. So here's your big idea. Take a picture, write it down, whatever you like to do. The God who is infinitely beautiful in his holiness will surely judge the false glamour of sin and vindicate the beauty he has won for his church all to the praise of his glory. So I'll read that again because I think it it is important to internalize this. I'll give you an extra few seconds to get it down on paper on your phone. The God who is infinitely beautiful. I just want to highlight this. The God who is infinitely beautiful. Perhaps you've never thought about God this way before. But God is infinitely beautiful. All right, there's something you look, you, you, you behold the Lord and you think this is beauty. This is absolute beauty. The God who is infinitely beautiful in his holiness will surely judge the false glamour of sin and vindicate the beauty he has won for his church all to the praise of his glory. So a ring of gold and a pig's snout. 
Uh, maybe you're familiar with this proverb. We're going to get to in a second. Uh, but this is an image that's helped me over the years, really helped me over the years as I think about hmm, what's beautiful, what is really beautiful. And as we see here what God does to the false beauty of sin, I'm going to kind of draw our attention to thinking about, okay, can we think about sin this way? This should be helpful as the allure, temptation of sin shows up at your doorstep. How is it, as we've seen over the past few weeks, God judges that which pretends to be beautiful, and he says, okay, this is not good. Do not pursue this. We get to this part here, and the people of God are praising God for how he's judged it. How do we think about sin? Way on this earth, it's helpful and right. Again, verses one through three. I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with their morality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. For he has judged the great prostitute. So there's a kind of beauty, there's a kind of allure to sin that projects beauty. So when you think about projecting beauty, you think about, I, I want to look a certain way, or right? you get up in the morning, you put makeup on, you put certain clothes on, you do certain things that you want people to see you in a particular light. And what I would argue for you guys is that sin does this for you, okay? Every day that sin wakes up, as it were, sin says, I want to look a certain way. Sin wakes up and says, I want to be seen a certain way. And so sin portrays itself in a certain light. It's, it's, it's always kind of in this PR mode of saying, look at me in a particular way. And, and, and in this, I'm going to allure you. I'm going to draw you. I'm going to, I'm going to fish you in. That's what sin does. There's a kind of allure to sin that projects beauty, though its end is decay and judgment. I don't need to, I, I, I think, argue this for you too much this morning because the past few weeks, like I said, we've seen how God has repeatedly said the end of this, the end of this world, the end of the way of this world is decay. And it is destruction. It's dissolution. It's dissolution. It's saying everything that has pretended to be beautiful in the place of that which is truly beautiful, everything that has pretended to be good in the place of that which is good will one day be brought to a collapse, to a final end. So by way of reminder, verses 1 through 3 in Revelation 18 says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice. So remember, I'm going to remind you of this again, remind you of this even though I'm not going to try to argue it for you because I think the past few weeks have been helpful enough to convince you of this. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So again, this has been portrayed sin has taken thousands of years to convince people mm, you want me you want me and what we saw in chapter 18 is that God has said yes you have you've portrayed yourself this way sin you've done this and you've corrupted the way of the earth but you'll be brought to an end you will be dissolved you will be destroyed as it's personified as it were in this city of Babylon okay so that's that's a clear picture for us that we've already seen. Like I alluded to, um, there's a helpful proverb. As we think about like how, how do we perceive sin as something that is not just abstract? How do we perceive sin that is something that, that does this, okay? When it personifies, we have the great prostitute, right? And the prostitute is always throwing herself out there. Look at me, look at me, have me, look at me, have me. And... Solomon, in writing the Proverbs, though he did not heed his own counsel, was nonetheless inspired by the Holy Spirit and gives this perspective. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. This is helpful imagery because there is a certain type of beauty that looks good. Okay? You're fooling yourself and you're trying to be too spiritual if you say that the model on the cover of a magazine doesn't have a certain type of beauty, okay? Don't, don't try to over-spiritualize that. However, the Bible would have us see that beauty in its proper light. And here's, here's how we see it. 
Solomon, as he gives this proverb, says, that beauty which we would ascribe to a particular thing, so in this case we have a gold ring. Think of a gold ring, a beautiful gold ring that might look really, really good in a particular setting. A gold ring put into the nose, the snout of a pig, is the way that you can perceive what seems to be beautiful but is actually attached to an unclean, disgusting thing. So when you think about the beauty that portrays itself as beautiful, when you think about the beauty of the model on the cover of a magazine, you think, hmm, sin is like this. Sin is like something that looks really good. Sin is something that looks really good to me and appeals to me, and sin does that. Sin is appealing. Sin is not unappealing. Sin comes to you, and temptation is real because you want it. That's just, that's just it. That's the reality. Sin is appealing. But the way that God would have us look at the allure and the beauty of sin as it portrays itself to us that way is to say, I see what you're doing. And he's going to say this out loud in your head, whatever it is. I see what you're doing, sin. I see what you're doing. But what you're doing is you're taking a type of beauty, like a gold ring. And you're taking this and, and you, are, you are attaching it to something that is so utterly unbeautiful that it makes the perceived beauty, worthless. This is a helpful thing just in a fight against lust, where you think, hmm, seems beautiful, but you take a step back and think, there is a beauty I perceive, but the beauty is attached to such an unclean thing that it's really ugly. And the Lord would have us understand sin this way, as we, we, we see the personification of sin and like Babylon the prostitute is saying, there is an allure. There is an allure. And don't deny that reality. Sin has an allure to it. But the perceived beauty is attached to such a dirty, ugly, worthless thing that to pursue it cancels out any perceived beauty whatsoever. And the reason why I just want to kind of camp on this for you here is that as we proceed through this passage and we see the people of God praising God, we see the people of God praising God for the beauty that he gives to his church. But what we're also seeing in verses one through three here is that the people of God are, are also praising God because he has judged what is falsely beautiful. God has brought judgment on this city that has, for all of us, projected the image of pursue me, pursue me, have me, have me, pursue me. And God has brought a final end to that which has made our lives miserable for so long. Temptation attaches to our hearts, right? These hearts, sin comes, temptation comes and lodges in here. So in the final analysis, we are guilty ourselves for what we do in our pursuit of sin, but also don't make the mistake of thinking that this world and the way that it tempts us is somehow going to be just like left alone as though it's a neutral object. God is to be praised for the judgment he's going to bring on the world and how it's complicated the way that we walk in it. God will judge false beauty. Proverbs 30, 12, there are those who are clean in their own eyes but are not washed of their filth. And Revelation 3, 14 through 19, this takes us back a handful of months, and I, I want you to think about this in terms of how it is that these professing Christians, as they are going through the world, as we are going through the world, as they're making choices, making decisions, as they're seeking that which is good and what is appealing to them, I want you to think in terms of what has been beautiful to them, what seems clean, what seems desirable, and then hear what God says to them. The same way that he would speak to us as we see this imagery of Babylon, the prostitute, being brought to an end, to be dissolved. Think as he's speaking to this church in a way that he would speak to probably most of the Western church today because we live with a sense of luxury and opulence and we don't take stock of how it might be doing something inside of us, how it might be reprioritizing things in a way different than God would have us. I hear what God says as he speaks in Christ to the church at Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. 
Well, that you are either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I have reproved and disciplined so be zealous and repent. And so as Jesus speaks to the church at Laodicea and as he speaks to, to all Christians throughout all ages, what he's telling us is like, don't fool yourself. Don't be like the emperor with no clothes. Don't waltz around with the idea that simply because other people are applauding you and they see you and they, they, they're saying the right things to you or don't be fooled into thinking that because you see yourself in a particular way, you look at yourself in the mirror or you look at your bank account, you look at your clothes, you look at your popularity, you look at your car, you look at your job, you look at your spouse, whatever it might be. Don't fool yourself into thinking that somehow these things are a measure of your beauty because we all wanna be beautiful we all want to pursue what's beautiful. And as Jesus speaks to this church, as he speaks to all Christians, he's saying, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself because you very well could be wretched, pitiable, blind, naked, poor. Well, you think yourself to be rich. Don't, don't give in to this type of temptation that says, Pursue that which is beautiful apart from what God has said is beautiful. These are professing Christian people, and Jesus is saying, don't be fooled. The end of these things, as we go throughout this, this very beautiful series of visions in Revelation, the end of these things is not beauty. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. So let's talk about true beauty. Here's, here's kind of our, our positive trajectory our positive vision, because I want us to see how the people of God praise God for that which is truly beautiful. We want to do that. We want to see that. Verses 4 through 8, And the 24 elders and the four living uh, creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So when the false beauty of sin is judged, God will be glorified in the true beauty of holiness, he has graciously given to his people. So in this picture, again, we have false beauty being judged. God is saying, Babylon, you have pretended to be beautiful for too long. You have pretended to be beautiful. You have shown yourself to the whole world to be something desired in my place. You have pretended that you are desirable in my place. And at the very end, God says, you are done. You will not any longer be seen this way. You will be shown to be unclean. You'll be shown to be dissolved and destroyed and full of decay. And at the same time here, God then turns our attention and and he wants us to see that there is this beautiful picture, that which is truly beautiful coming into view, which is this, this picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. This picture of a marriage supper. So um, if you've been married before, you've probably wanted your wedding to look beautiful, okay? Sometimes there's a utilitarian wedding that takes place, but most people have this idea that they want their wedding to be something that people come to and enjoy themselves, that they see it's put together well. They have a good experience, they have good food, that they spent time with people that they liked, cared about, that they saw something that they enjoyed. Right, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars are spent on wedding dresses. Not because they're ugly, but because they're beautiful. People dress in very unique ways for weddings. Even in a culture that is very, very casual, people dress in these unique ways because we, we want to be seen like, this is the height of beauty. This is as, as beautiful as I'm going to get, basically. This is how weddings are typically portrayed. This is like 
the, the highlight of your personal beauty throughout your whole life. And this has been the case for, for thousands of years. Weddings have always been this. this there's this beauty, and, and you think, like, for, a, for a, a woman who may grow up, she's thinking from, you know, age three or something. I mean, Lucy is three years old. She plays with Barbies, and she talks about having little weddings, and I mean, this is just what happens. You have this idea, like, I want this to be beautiful. I want this to be pretty. I want this to be pleasant and nice. And the vision we have here, as we turn our eyes from the decay of Babylon, is a vision of this beautiful wedding. And we've already seen the spotless lamb. We've seen Jesus, we've seen him exalted, we've seen him praised, we've seen him enjoyed and marveled at and glorified among his people, we've seen that in all these different visions, but now we're having this new character effectively introduced, and that is what we'll come to see is like this other city. We have Babylon, the prostitute. Now we're going to see the people of God represented later on as Jerusalem, the holy city, the people of God gathered together in the presence of God, and she is beautiful. She is truly beautiful. She's truly beautiful. And the marriage, the wedding of the Lamb is a beautiful sight to behold. Psalm 29, 1 through 2, this is uh, kind of actually lifted a little bit from Psalm 96. they borrow from each other as we read earlier today. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. This is, this is something that I think is, is a worthy topic of reflection for us. We think like, what, why is holiness something to be desired? Why is it when you think about like worshiping God as a holy God, why is this a desirable thing? And, 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 and perhaps you've not had categories to think in before when you think about holiness as a beautiful thing. A lot of people might grow up thinking about holiness as something that is just something you don't do. All right, maybe holiness for some people has been you have spent your life uh, hearing, well, well, to be holy means you're set apart and so you don't do this, 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 and this. That holiness is just things that you don't do. So holy people are not like other people because these other people do things and you don't do those things. And there is a sense in which it's good, right, to not do wicked things. But that's not what holiness really is. Holiness is a quality to how one's life is carried out as it reflects the God who is holy. And the God who is holy is not a God who simply refrains from doing things. When the psalmist calls us here to worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, he's saying, you come into God's presence and you perceive that in his otherness, God is utterly desirable. That God is utterly desirable. As you see him, you think, God, not only are you not like me in as much as you don't do the bad things that I do. But to consider, Lord, who you are, to consider what you have done, to consider that you are the one who who has painted the sky. You are the one who has made the sun. I mean, just, it was last night, we had this mini moon. It's what it's called, the mini moon. Not like the moon changed size, but you look on the horizon as as the moon is rising, and it's this beautiful little orange ball. I think that's pretty. You know why it's pretty? It's because God made it pretty. And it's just a small reflection of how beautiful God is. This is something that non-Christian people perceive as well. You, you look at the whole creator and you think, this is beautiful. And God has designed it to be beautiful so that we might see that he is infinitely beautiful. That God is desirable because in his creativity, he has made things to be enjoyed. And when you think about... Um, eating good food. I I like this. I like the taste of this. I think God created you with taste buds so you can taste. God is to be worshipped because he has done these things. He's created. He He has made and he has done it well. He has done good things. And so when we worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, worshiping God, not simply because, well, you just don't do things, God. It's, God, what have you done? 
What have you done? And, and the scene here that we have of this marriage supper of the Lamb, what we're seeing is that God has, has gathered his people. We've seen this earlier in Revelation. He's gathered people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. He's gathered them together, and now he's, he is bringing them to his son and dressed them up in the most beautiful garments in the entire universe. Pure, spotless garments. He's gathered his people up and he has clothed them with garments of, in, in theology we call it, the active obedience of Jesus. What that means is that the beauty of Jesus is character and his perfection that's counted to you. When you're justified, when, when you are counted with righteousness before the sight of God as you trust in Jesus, there's a beauty that is attached to you that God clothes you with. And so the, the beauty that is attached to the people of God is the beauty of Jesus' character, his full obedience to the Father. And it's this white, beautiful garment that he just he gives to his people. It's beautiful. And I would like us, I'd like you, I'd like me, to think about holiness in those terms that is beautiful. It's not just this cheap way of looking at things. I don't do this. It's the beauty of living in the sight of God. The beauty of living is one whose life has been changed so that not only do you not do things, but now you do things differently. Your chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And the garments he gives you is a beautiful garment. You just start living out of that. Ephesians 5, Paul draws our attention to this, this same picture in verses 25 through 27. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So why, why did he do this, Paul? That he might sanctify her, so that he might make her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the words, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, in beauty, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Paul is giving instruction here for marriage, but he also says that marriage is not in itself. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, that, that marriage, that the, the way a husband and wife should relate, is a husband should seek the beauty of his wife not by giving her loads of money to get makeup and clothes and whatever, though it's not wrong to have makeup and clothes, but that his primary concern should be that she is beautiful with the true beauty that God defines. And men, you're called to be beautiful too. It might seem a strange thought to think about being a beautiful man, but Christian man, you're called to be beautiful because Jesus is doing this work that you picture in your relationship to your wife. You're helping her to be beautiful. That's simply a shadow and a reflection of how Jesus is working in you. He's making you pretty because your sin is ugly. And he's working in you. He has set you apart. He's making you holy. And he is bringing you to this place where one day there's going to be this beautiful vision, this marriage feast, this supper, where you're going to be brought into the presence of God in this unique way with all the other saints. You'll be brought before him. And, and literally the angels in heaven are going to just gasp in awe at how beautiful you, sinner, are. It's going to happen to you one day, Christian. All of the concern you have about your physical ugliness, the things you don't like about yourself, the things that you look at and say, I don't like how I look like this. I don't like how I act like this. I don't like how I feel like this. One day it's going to be gone and it's going to be replaced with absolute beauty and perfection. So much so that the whole cosmos will wonder at the beauty that you hold. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, 
Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We hear this and we think, okay, God's called me to maturity. And I just want to put this other little angle on it for you. He calls you to maturity, but a maturity that is pleasing in his sight. So just consider, as, as you grow as a Christian, God looks at you and like, hmm, I like that. As you put sin to death, and as you live in obedient faith, as you say, you know what, I, I'm not going to live like I did before, I'm going to live in this way now, in a way that by the power of the Holy Spirit I'm given to live to reflect the glory of Christ, God looks at you and like, that's pretty, you're pretty to me. I mean, nobody, nobody likes to hear you're ugly. Nobody in this room, nobody in this room whatsoever. That if, you know, you go to the store and you try on a piece of clothing and you go and you ask somebody, how does this make me look? They say, you ugly. Nobody likes that. And we have here this picture of as you grow, as you mature as a Christian, that you have this assurance that God grows you as, you as you become what you already are. God looks at you and says, it's pretty. I like it. I like what I see. What an unimaginable thought. Think that the God who knows your heart should look at you and say, knowing all your flaws and faults, you're pretty to me. Verses 8 through 10 draw our attention here as we close out because I want us to pursue beauty. I don't want us to think about beauty. I want to pursue it. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So get that stuck in your head right now. They said, yeah, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. We're going to camp out on that. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The adornment of the church, so the, the beautifying garments, the adornment of the church, is by the gracious working of God in leading his people to God-centered, God-glorifying lives. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. As Peter is speaking to the church, as she's been scattered and as she's suffering, as she's experiencing different things in a world, in a Babylon world, that is saying, you, you have me. You have me. If you don't have me, you're going to suffer. If you don't have me, you're going to be miserable. So have me. Peter says, as you come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood who offers spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So as you're being built up, as you're maturing, as God is beautifying you, there's something that's happening. And it is God who is, who is taking you and he's bringing you together as his people. And this is something that I would just emphasize here. This is a together project. This is not just you. You are not personally the bride of Christ. You are part of the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is his church, his people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. That is the bride of Christ. Local church exists to display this in the diversity of our backgrounds and, and our interests and our ages and all these different things exists to show that God is bringing this together. He's making this happen. He's making this work occur. When people look at the local church, they should see a beautiful thing. And most of you have seen ugly churches, ugly local churches. Look at a church and say, that's ugly. It's not ugly because it has unattractive people in it. It's ugly because nasty things go on inside of it that go unchecked. If you've seen church conflict happen before, church splits, church division happen, it's ugly, it's gross, it gives a bad image of Jesus because the church is supposed to be beautiful. The church is supposed to be seen. And so this is, Jesus is beautiful. This church looks like Jesus. And as Peter speaks here about what's happening, as, as the Lord is gathering you together, he's making you this house, 
like little stones, living stones, bring it together. He's building this beautiful house, this beautiful structure. And he goes on then to say, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but you are now God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received it. So kind of as the header over all of this, as we think about what is it to pursue beauty? Think we're, we're gathered together into this body. We exist together in this body. And what is it then? What is it then to, to pursue this beauty? If we want God to look at us and say, you're pretty. I like what you did. It's just, you're pretty to me. You want to live in a life that says, God, it's ugly. How did you write this, my son? But what you're doing right now, it's ugly, kid. Don't like it. What stands as the header over all of this that you are this people, that you may do something, that you may proclaim the excellencies of God, that you may proclaim the beauty of God. You may proclaim the worth of God. Christian, to pursue beauty is to have this kind of ban over your life of saying, I exist by God and for God, that my life exists so that I might display God, that all that who, who he is, as much as I'm able to, with my brothers and sisters in Christ, I might display that to this world. And if God is beautiful, you should be beautiful. If God is holy, you should be holy. If God is adorned in splendor, as you approach him, you say, this is a beautiful God. I see him, and I say, this, this is different. The church to look different. And again, it's not different because the church just sits around and doesn't do bad things. The church is different because when, when you come in, and as an example, you come and you play basketball with some Christian guys, they're not swearing, they're not throwing elbows, but instead, they're encouraging each other Nice shot. I mean, it's just a small thing, a really small thing. But it's different. Because you go play pickup ball with guys who don't know Jesus, they really don't care. Imagine what it's like. You, you come in, and you're used to that, and then you encounter guys who are literally like encouraging each other when they're losing. I'm thinking, this guy just lost, but he's okay with it. It's different, right? The church is different. And the church is different because we exist for God. So, so you, you live there, you play basketball this way so that you can tell people God is different. God is different than you may perceive him to be. God is different than the God that you may worship if you don't worship Jesus. God is different because he's holy, and he's good. I play basketball differently because of Jesus. And over your whole life, Christian, whatever it is you do, as elsewhere it says in Scripture, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Everything you do is done so that people might see that God is glorious. These are the righteous garments, the beautiful garments that the people of God wear. It's God giving them to you, saying, all right, son, all right, daughter, let's show, let's show the world what I'm like. Let's show the world what I'm like. Paul says this in Ephesians 2, by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before and that we should walk in them. Don't ever let it be lost on you. We're going to see this in a second, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. Never be lost on you that the life that you live, this different life that you live, the life that you live that is doing good things is anything other than a life that is supernaturally fueled by the grace of God, the sovereign grace of God. As Paul speaks to the church at Ephesus, he speaks to the church everywhere, he's saying, it is God's work in you that makes you different. It is God's work in you that makes you different. So as you interact with people, as you speak with people, as you interact in a world that is filled with people that exist just like you once existed, you make sure Christian, that they know that the only thing that's different about you 
is that God has made you different. This is the humility of the gospel, the humility of the church that needs to exist at all times. If, if, if there is a gospel without humility, it, it, you've neutered the gospel. You completely neutered it. If the gospel exists to show the world that you're different because you're different and you tried harder, that's not gospel. The gospel is, by definition, a humbling reality. If you haven't been humbled by seeing your sin and recognizing that you need somebody else's beautiful garments on because you don't have any for yourself, that you haven't encountered the gospel. But when you do that and you recognize, I, I am pitiable, I am poor, I'm blind, I'm naked, and I need other garments, I can't make them for myself. And you come to Jesus and you ask him, will you please, will you please give me your garments? Will you please give me your righteousness? Please clothe me because I don't have anything. I have tattered rags and that's it. Yes, here you go. And then even as you are then this beautiful, righteous person, counted righteous, and then he says in verse 10, that you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. These things were prepared before and that you should do them. God has marked out a certain life for you, Christian, that it's different. And you live this different life and God marked it out for you and it's different and it is beautiful and it is good. I'm not gonna not gonna move away from this. I'll mention this again for you guys because I think it's important that we see among the beautiful things you do, I would say chief among them is that you let other people know how to escape the city of destruction, escape Babylon, and to be beautiful themselves. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God really cares about you being beautiful, Christian, and part of that beauty is that you should help other people see what's false beauty, what's true beauty, what is good and what is, what is not good, what's going to last and what will pass away. You have beautiful feet just by opening your mouth and telling somebody else about the Jesus who has made you different. So from head to toe, Jesus wants you to be beautiful. And you can lay your head down on your pillow at night, knowing that as you've sought to honor him in this, like, I did things that were pretty to God today. I did things that God looked at and said, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. It's pleasant to look at. I'll finish this morning by looking at 1 Corinthians 15.10, because... As John sees this vision, he hears something saying, it has been granted to the church to be clothed with these garments. And again, this just goes back to this, this idea of humility. Because we want you to be beautiful, but true beauty is humble. And here's how Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it is not I, but the grace of God that is with me. I want you this week to work really, 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 really hard to do beautiful things. And I want you this week in doing beautiful things to recognize that not a single second of that effort, not a single ounce of energy in that effort is there because you, you have generated it. Paul said that he worked harder than anybody else. He worked real hard. And he did really beautiful things. He preached the gospel to thousands of people, established new churches, trained pastors, all these different things. And yet he says, it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And Christian, that is how you are to live. That whatever beautiful things you do this week, whatever love you show to a brother or sister in Christ, whatever, whatever gospel words come out of your mouth as speaking to somebody about Jesus, whatever type of refraining from sin and temptation you might do, it's not you, it is the grace of God that is with you because at the end of all things, the one who is worshiped for the beauty of the bride 
is God, not the bride. The bride is not extolled as the one who is worthy of worship. It is the lamb. It is God. So pursue the beauty of holiness this week. Pursue the beauty of doing things that are pleasing in God's sight and understand that that beauty will not be beautiful if you're doing it for your own glory. That beauty is going to be beautiful if you are saying, Lord, will you be seen? Will you be seen? It is your grace at work within me. This is my desire. So don't pursue false beauty this week. Pursue true beauty. Pursue that which is good and do it for the glory of God. Worship team, please come on up. Let's pray together and we will sing to close our morning. Father, we thank you for how you have given us to your son to be a beautiful bride. We thank you for loving us. We are unlovely by nature. And yet you have loved us. And you have set us apart so that we might look different. I pray that this week, Lord, we would look different. Not simply because we don't do bad things, but because we do things that look like Christ. That we would display him in greater clarity and that we would do that together, Lord. Not simply on our own, but that we would do that together. Pray for basketball. Pray for small groups. Pray for corporate prayer. Pray for times of discipleship, one-on-one. I pray that we look beautiful because we're growing and we're maturing, being brought to look more and more like your son, Father. As we sing here together, please turn our hearts, turn our affections. As we think of your great love, as we think of what you have done for people who are unlovely, poor and powerless, that we would together glorify you Ask this for Jesus' sake, amen.